Welcome to the shooting show. This week we're out foxing with Sporting Rifles Mark Nicholson, plus we have an interesting interview on Lowland Deer with Scottish Factor Richard Cook. In East Yorkshire, the crops are off. Gamekeeper Mark Nicholson takes the opportunity to crack down on a couple of local Charlies. Mark is well known to sporting rifle readers as a foxing pro, and now we are going to see him in action. He talks us through some of his essential kit. Right, the, um, the rifle tonight is the um, 243 Zolly. Uh, I'm using Remington Accutip, 75 grain Accutip bullets, um, T8 sound moderator and a Zeiss Duralite uh, illuminated 3 to 12 by 50 scope. All light force lamps, 170 strikes with amber filter. We have the latest 170 again, 170 strike with the um, Exion HD bulb and light force battery pack in case we have to do any walking. On the roof we have um, Hands free, so if you're shooting on your own you can put the lamp on the fox and shoot out the cab. Hopefully we'll be going around some stubble fields, um, there's still quite a lot of wheat fields left to combine. Um, the night, it's uh, quiet moonlight at the moment, um, anyway we'll see how we get on. Right. Uh, this evening we'll be Shooting out of a box on the back of the pickup, um, it's a method that I came across when I was um, gamekeeping. Uh, basically, on a typical evening, we have one man driving, one man lamping, one man with the rifle. The um, idea is you spot the fox, stop the driver, and it doesn't matter where the fox is, as long as it's in a safe position, you've got 360 degree shooting um, with a solid rest and um, it's uh, the best method I've come across so far. Mark checks the lamps are in place and gives the rifle the final once over before setting out to scan the stubbles. With his cousin in tow to navigate the fields they begin taking a tour around the likely locations scanning for the telltale flash of fiery eyes. What happens is there's um, a beck or fairly wide river on our left um, and foxes come from the reserve, run up as far as the chicken farm a uh, mile up in front and cross over bridges, it's the only way across either side of the beck. At last they spot some confirmed vulpine eyes on the horizon across a stubble field. Mark does his best to bring it in, this time though, Charlie resists. Um, as you saw then we just see the fox out in the middle of a 80 acre stubble field. Um, we stopped, tried to give it a call. Um, it was right on brow of a hill, probably just about in range, but anyway, it wouldn't respond to the call. Um, we went round, tried to get in a better angle for a shot, but it moved off up the field, um, through the edge onto the neighbouring farm. We're just going to go around and see if we can catch up with him. Again, they head into the night, and soon after they locate two more foxes. This time, the reaction is positive. This is likely to be a cub and it comes right into the call. At around 30 yards it's stopped in its tracks. Mark turns off the lamp and squeaks again before scanning the ground once more. Sure enough a second pair of eyes show up and it's play by play repetition of the previous shot. The fox coming in to be dropped on the spot. With a brace in the bag, Mark heads off to find the carcasses amid the stubble. Right at the end of the night, um, we set off quite quiet, um, very little about, moonlit, very still night. Um, we were out quite early, just after dark. Um, first couple of hours, saw one wary fox that you saw on film. But um, it made off, probably an old one. Um, 
towards the end, it, a bit of cloud cover come in, um, blotted the moon out a little bit, and um, we came across two, possibly three. We thought we saw one after we'd uh, called and shot these two, but kept on calling. Um, it didn't show any more, but um, a good result to the night, really. So there's a lot of wheat about still, and you know, I reckon another 10 days, get some nice weather. And uh, once they get all the crops down, that's when um, you see the cubs and they start moving about a lot more. Mark isn't the only one out for foxes. North of the border in Scotland, Byron joins buddies Aidan and Stuart on a short excursion. Aidan already has one fox down before he joins Stuart close to the witching hour. I think there's a gate halfway down here. Or right down in the bottom. There's one or the other. There's definitely one right in the bottom. They soon locate a fox and the game is on. A few squeaks later and another one joins the list. And I just went, well, if I don't take the shot, I'm not going to get another chance at him. Bingo, that'll do it. Two in the bag. Told you we get more than one tonight. Stuart takes the opportunity to chat to Eden about the importance of knowing your ground. It's like the same going with a rangefinder and going, you just ping it like from the road to the edge of the field, you know, uh, 200 yards, anything in this field from the road is killable. It's not been a bad night all in all. The foxes north and south of the border will no doubt be joining us again soon as the winter sets in. Dead Eye Mark there dealing with the vulpine menace. And now, the shooting show news. This is the shooting show news. Details have emerged of a plot to stop people eating game shot with lead ammunition, without proper scientific evidence to back it up. Last week, the Food Standards Agency suspended plans to warn consumers that they should seriously limit the amount of game they eat. The FSA said the guidance was not ready, but private concerns of some anti-shooting members of the lead ammunition group saw a scaremongering article appear in The Guardian last Thursday. Making public claims is the discretion from the lead ammunition group's role, which is to consider scientific evidence and offer advice to DEFRA and the FSA. Midland Game Fair organisers have released details of the show's visitor numbers. It is estimated that a staggering 103,000 people came through the gates of Western Park, an increase of 13,000 on last year. With the Midland marking its 30th year, breaking the six-figure mark is a fitting milestone and a successful end to a summer plagued by poor conditions. The Basque Trophy measuring service was kept busy at the Midland, measuring heads non-stop from 8am till 3pm on both days. This unprecedented level of interest saw no fewer than 35 heads measured over the weekend, including a platinum medal. Sporting Rifle magazine has details of all the trophy heads measured and will be printing them in a special Midland trophy feature in the December issue. Farmers and their families have once again been threatened by activists as the planned badger cull draws closer. Antis have stepped up a campaign of intimidation and public scaremongering that jeopardises the safety of the cull areas. One farmer told the press she had pulled out of the cull after receiving threatening phone calls. The cull may now have to be delayed, even though it has the support of DEFRA, the High Court and the Court of Appeal. Natural England has opened up its freehold National Nature Reserves under the Countryside and Rights of Way Act, but Basque has assured shooters that they should not be affected. Basque has already spoken to Natural England to ensure that shooters' views are taken into account under the new access plans. Tim Russell, Basque's Director of Conservation, said Natural England was committed to involving those with sporting rights at an early stage in the new arrangements. That was the Shooting Show News. Byron catches up with Richard Cook of the Lowland Deer Network Scotland, who talks us through the genesis of the organisation and the crucial role it plays in Scottish deer management. Richard, can you tell me uh, what the Lowland Deer Network Scotland is all about? Yes, well, the Lowland Deer Network Scotland was set up um, in November last year, 2011, uh, and it uh, came about as a concept um, really originating um, from the Association of Deer Management Groups, of which I, I'm chairman, 
recognising that after many years we had failed to find a way of connecting with the managers of lowland deer uh, in the way that we do with the managers of red deer in the uplands. In the lowlands the situation is quite different because the um, mainly roe deer but other species as well, red, seeker and fallow, hopefully not too many muntjac, um, range freely over um, the whole of the lowlands and right into the urban and semi-urban areas um, but there is no um, collective approach to their management so the, the management of the land is much more fragmented and the deer behave differently, there are territorial deer as opposed to a herding deer and they're required to be addressed in, in much, basically in much smaller, at a much smaller scale. What the Lowland Deer Network does is to bring together that very diverse and often divergent bunch of individuals and representatives in a way that should um, develop into a coordinated approach. So on the development committee which we've set up, which numbers about 25 in total, we have representatives of existing organisations like the British Deer Society, uh, the Scottish Gamekeepers Association, the British Association of Shooting and Conservation, uh, and then we have representatives of the government bodies like Scottish Natural Heritage, uh, Forest Enterprise Scotland, and uh, Transport Scotland in view of the road traffic accidents um, interest. Um, we have representatives of the, of the National Farmers Union Scotland, uh, Scottish Landowners, uh, Scottish Land and Estates as, as they're now called, um, and uh, of course the Association of Deer Management Groups itself. Um, so this is not about creating a new organisation which some people have taken it to be and quite rightly criticised because we've got too many organisations in the countryside together. It's about bringing existing organisations and existing effort together uh, to add value rather than to reinvent the wheel. So talking specifically of lowland deer management, geographically speaking, what does that mean? Well, we spent some time thinking about that because it isn't possible to draw a line between the lowlands and the highlands that is meaningful in deer terms because, of course, you get red deer um, overspilling into the lowlands, particularly in winter, and you get roe deer well into the uplands, uh, particularly on the grouse moors of the eastern highlands. How we've defined it is the uh, whole of the south of Scotland, the central belt, um, which is largely urban or near urban, then up the eastern seaboard, so all the arable counties of the east of Scotland, right up to Caithness and Sutherland. Richard, this is obviously quite an ambitious project to get so many people together to follow a, a similar pattern of thinking. How are you going to fund all of this? Well, it's a little bit hand-to-mouth in this first year, our development year, so to speak. Um, we are very fortunate in that Scottish Natural Heritage and Forest Commission uh, think this is a project worth doing. They think it will help them to do their job. Uh, we have to convince them in the longer term that that's right. Uh, and they have provided start-up funding for the first year. In addition, to my surprise and pleasure, Transport Scotland have made a contribution because this is quite central to some of their interests and that's very encouraging. We are a membership organisation and we uh, have uh, had a number of people join since the, quite a number of people join since the um, organisation was launched last November. There is an annual subscription of £25 uh, in return for which people are kept very much in the loop with uh, regular communications, references to the website, that sort of thing. We also have a subscription of £100 for organisations like local authorities and existing deer management groups. So in terms of your vision over the next, say, four to five years for lowland deer management, how, do you, how would you like to see things panning out? Well, uh, it's evolution rather than revolution. We've started a process uh, which I think is really important and will make it easier to manage deer as a resource in Scotland as a whole. Um, so really what we've, it's a hearts and minds job to be blunt about it, we've got to get people to see that this is, is, a, is a project worth doing and that the people who volunteered to help out at the moment, as I say about 25 people have come forward to do that, representing a very wide range of geographical and interest areas, that they'll continue to give us their time and uh, indeed set up local initiatives. There are a number of ideas at an early stage at the moment which we'll take through next year and I'm just looking for them to multiply. Um, but the proof of the pudding, I guess, will be that we don't have any uh, emergencies with far too many deer in, in small places uh, and that when we do, we have the resources uh, and the manpower behind it to organise to, 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 to deal with situations. And if uh, people want to be involved, how do they get in touch? Well, uh, they can find us online on www.deer-management.co.uk I'm ready to go to local meetings and talk to local people at any opportunity. 
Uh, in fact, I'd look for those opportunities. I would welcome invitations. And um, it's, a get, it's really about getting the message out there. Thanks for watching. That's it for this week. We're out every Monday, 7.30pm UK time. This is The Shooting Show.